movie talk for movie fans. I'm Chris Lee Kennedy and this is a show we bring you the day's biggest movie news and of course we give you insight into what it all means. Joining me as always is AMC Movie News Senior Editor Mr. John Campia. Greetings and salutations my international friends. <laughs> Welcome to AMC Movie Talk, the best damn movie related show on the internet. Coming to you from the stream.tv here in Hollywood, California. We are so glad you made us part of your day. We also have joining us our AMC Movie News Editor Miss Amy Rose Eisenbach. Hello lovelies, hope you had a nice weekend and a little shout out to my dad, it's his birthday, love you pops. <laughs> and we also have director of the upcoming film, The Death of Superman Lives, what happened? Mr. John Schnepp. Hey, someone was like saying I should get you to, to say that to Nicolas Cage when I finally get him. <laughs> like, Nicolas Cage, what happened? But then he asked for producer credit so I had to be like, out, son. out. <laughs> and this is live today. All right, listen, yeah, we are doing the show live, and uh, we're so glad you joined us. Listen, before we get into it, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that's actually come up <laughs> that we need to address here. But now, before we get into the movie news stuff, just a couple of quick things. Number one, we announced on Friday that on January 2nd, we're going to be doing a 24-hour live streaming AMC Movie Talk Marathon to help raise money for the uh, typhoon disaster relief efforts with the Red Cross in the Philippines. Look, I know it's kind of out of the news headlines now, but the disaster there is just undescribable and the need is amazingly great. And we decided that we wanted to do something to use our collective nerd powers to actually do some good. Um, and uh, we decided we were going to do a fundraiser and our goal was to reach $3,000 because I'll be honest with you. You know this, you know this, Chris Lee knows this. As an internet community, we have a real sense of entitlement to everything for free. I know I do. And trying to get money out of people on the internet is next to impossible. We have over 3.5 million people every month watch AMC Movie Talk videos, right? But I bet if we charged $1 a month, it would be like 300 views right. or videos. Aww. So I thought when I set our goal of raising $3,000 between now and when we do, and, and by the completion of the marathon, I thought I was being too ambitious. Thanks to you guys, we have raised over $3,000 in three days. So Woo! we changed the goal amount mm -hmm. uh, to $6,000. Uh, so you can see right underneath me here a URL uh, at www.crowdrise.com slash AMC Movie News Philippines. There's also a link in the description of this video that you can just click. You can don't go there, just click donate now, and you can donate some cash to a really good cause and thank you for your support don't forget to join us on january 2nd uh, the other thing i want to mention uh, also kind of as a thank you to you guys um, the big annual ces and new media expo events are coming up they're back to back in las vegas and a part of that thing is the academy of web television and they announced their nominees this year and amc movie talk has been nominated for two awards including best a uh, best news show uh, online. So we're really, really excited about that. The second nomination that we got was for me as, as Best Host Live. Thank you so much for your support and uh, helping that become a reality. We're really excited about it. Now, on to movie news. We have, as you can see here, we have a <laughs> bunch of movie news items that we have all lined up and ready to go. But here's the problem. Sometimes between when we finish writing the movie news stories and I get in my car to come to the studio, new news breaks and like three movie news items have broke since I got in the car and came here. Uh, and the first one is this. The first trailer for 22 Jump Street has hit the web. Uh, I don't have a description or a link to it in the description of the video because I was on my way over here. Uh, but I'm sure you guys can find it on YouTube. Just search for it. We just sat down and watched it. Uh, Amy Rose, your quick impressions on the 22 Jump Street trailer. I loved it. This was one of the best surprises of a comedy in such a long time for me. I was like, okay, remaking a TV show, but now it's a comedy, which it really wasn't. And I, Channing Tatum, and you know, I love Jonah Hill, but he always kind of plays the same character until recently where he's actually started acting. Um, so I was just kind of like, whatever. And that movie blew me away. It was hilarious. They had great chemistry. This trailer, it just looks like it's going to continue right where we left off. Super quirky and funny. And I'm so glad Ice Cube is back because I loved him <laughs> in that movie. So yeah, I was laughing. And uh, I think that I'm really excited to see the adventure of the two of them again. Schnapp, what do you think about the trailer? Uh, <clears throat> I loved 21 Jump Street, the movie, and I am so happy that they're making 22 Jump Street. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My boy Nick Offerman's back yeah. in it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it was just, it's more of the same, only now they're in college. college. So brand new adventures, extra stupidity. I can't wait. I mean, just seeing that trailer put me in such a good mood this morning. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and I get to, I, I thought the trailer was hilarious. I thought it was a very funny trailer. Now, it you could make a criticism that says it just feels exactly the same as the first one 
Maybe. But that, to me, that ain't a bad thing. Uh, last, last year, 21 Jump Street was my second favorite comedy of the year. Just a hair behind Ted 2 for me. Uh, I know a lot of people have it the other way around. The, the point is, is a really great, great comedy. comedy. Now, they're going back to school to find a new drug and the <laughs> drug dealer. It's the exact yeah, same yeah, thing. Yeah. But I don't care. I want more of that. It, yeah. it looks really funny. They're still too old for college, but at least we're getting closer to the age Yeah, at least they're getting <laughs> closer to the proper <laughs> age range. Uh, it looks really, really good. I'm excited for it. So if you haven't seen it yet, just look it up on YouTube. 22 Jump Street trailer. You should be able to find it, no problem. Uh, another piece of movie news, uh, these two next two stories are kind of connected to each other. Um, it was announced that the Weinstein brothers are now back in bed with Miramax, and like the first two projects they're going to do together, apparently, number one, they're both sequels. A sequel to the Academy Award winning best picture film, Shakespeare in Love. So they're going to do a sequel to Shakespeare in Love, and the other one they said they're going to do almost immediately is Rounders 2. And apparently, if you, I interpreted the comments they made that Matt Damon's back on board, um, so is uh, Edward, Norton. Edward Norton, and they're talking to Robert De Niro to be the new kind of bad guy. Might as well, um, just throw him in any, any well. gangster movie. <laughs> so um, let's first talk about here about Shakespeare in Love, and, and I'll start this off. I, I know a lot of people turned on Shakespeare in Love when it won Best Picture over Saving Private Ryan. Mm. A lot of people turned against it because they wanted Saving Private Ryan to win. I understand why people wanted that to win. Personally, I thought Shakespeare in Love was a brilliant film. I thought it was fantastic. I loved the performances in it. Uh, you got Voldemort's little brother uh, in the leading role. And, and Joseph Fiennes is... Amazing. He is yeah. every bit the actor his brother is. I think he's one of the... I can't believe this guy never achieved A-list Hollywood status because he's award-winning like caliber in everything that he's in. And he's cuter. <laughs> and he's, he's a good looking dude. Um, and so, but I gotta admit, I, where do you go with a sequel to Shakespeare in Love? I mean, the continuing stories of Shakespeare, I, I guess, but uh, this one doesn't seem as natural to me as Rounders, but we'll talk about Rounders in a second. Schnepp, you ju I just told you about this news, so you haven't had a chance to read up on it or anything. Yeah. What do you think? What is your first impression? Yeah, well, I told you my first impression. <laughs> Double eye roll. It's like, really? Shakespeare in Love 2? Bankrupt? Hollywood? I mean, those just go together. Shakespeare in Love in space. Maybe I'll see it then. You guys kill me. All right, that's all I can say about it. Amy Rose? Yeah, I, I loved Shakespeare in Love. I thought it was absolutely charming. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow was fantastic. And I love when they tell a story, you know, the untold story, where they take a little bit of fantasy mixed with, you know, an iconic figure like Shakespeare that we know. Um, but I just thought it ended on such a perfect note. I mean, he was telling his next story, and you see Gwyneth, because they have to separate, you know, walking or his muse at the time. And I just thought it ended so, so in a, such a great place. So I don't think it's necessary. Sure, I'll watch it, but you know, some films leave the door open for more, and I really didn't think this did. Wait, are so. you trying to say that this felt more like a movie to you? Like it had a yeah. beginning, middle, and end? <laughs> yeah, it really did. It didn't necessarily segue into a sequel. Is that no. what you're telling Can me? Can you imagine? That that's films really... actually didn't have a trilogy plan back that's, then. That's really weird. <laughs> I, I gotta mention I can, this. Can't Eric, get behind it. Eric Tish in the, in the chat board right now is saying, you can call it Shakespeare in divorce. Oh, so, how, re how relevant. So look, I'm gonna give it, just because I like the first one so much, I'm, I'm gonna give it a shot, but I am, yeah. I am puzzled. I'm yeah. puzzled by it. All right, let's talk about the other one they were talking about. And I gotta tell you, to me, this one makes more sense. Mm -hmm. They're talking about doing a Rounders 2. Uh, and they said, look, Matt Damon and Edward Norton have been on board, this is what he said anyway. Weinstein said, they've been on board to do another one. They've been open to do another for a long time. And so they're looking and they're saying this one will have more of an international flavor. Ooh. Like it'll start with a poker tournament in Paris or something like that. And John Malkovich is obviously out, bringing in Robert De Niro to be the new villain. Um, I like this. Now, granted, I'm a little bit biased because I'm a huge poker yeah. nut. I, I play a <laughs> lot of poker. Um, and Rounders, like a lot of poker players today, Rounders is one of the films that really kind of got me into playing poker. Uh, and it's really probably still the movie that best captures the whole culture of poker, I suppose. But you're adding a name like uh, De Niro to it, it's got really good potential. I like seeing De Niro play villainous types of roles, and he doesn't do it often. Uh, let's not talk about that one he did with the Rocky and Bullwinkle, mm. where he was the, the that doesn't leader. Count. Right. That, that doesn't one count. doesn't count. Um, <laughs> I, so I got to, I'm actually really intrigued about Arounders 2, and especially with Damon and, and Norton coming back. 
and hopefully the addition of De Niro. I think this sounds pretty cool, Amiros. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's kind of funny because we talked about this a couple of months ago. I think it was a mailbag question. We're like, you know, do you think we'll ever see a, a rounder two or do you want one? And mm. I, Edward Norton, you know, he's made a couple interesting career choices, but I still think he's one of the best. I mean, American History X mm. right there. And rounders, he was amazing in it. And I loved his chemistry with Matt Damon. And I am a sucker for gambling heist kind of films. Um, and I just thought all the elements were great. The storytelling was great, the narration. and. I, I'm, I will see this very happily, and uh, Robert De Niro, he's making good, he was just an American Hustle, Silver Linings, he's, he's getting his career back. I'm proud of you, De Niro. <laughs> Schnapp. Wait, where did his career go? I thought he always had a career. Where, where, De Niro. Uh, well, yeah, the but films? De Niro, well, for about a 10 year stretch he was there, like was kind of comedy. He was Meet uh, the Fockers, and you know, I was like, you know, we all, we were Meet like, yo, get that check. I'll go with. Yeah. I was like, get that check, one. son. I, I was cool, I, I always knew he'd come back. He's an incredible, you know, he is. And the yeah. He just made, he just decided to sit back and mail it in for yeah. a while. Yeah. But it does seem like in the last couple of years he's, he's decided it back. to turn to, to be Robert De Niro. Right. Yeah. Grudge yeah. match. I can't wait to see I that. Cannot yeah. I cannot wait for That's grudge gonna be match. Fun. So Rounders too. Can you just tell me what year did the first Rounders come out? Oh gosh. Because I remember yeah. seeing it in the theater and I really liked it. But well, it, was, it was like ten years ago. It was at least after Johnny F and Chan, so I, I'm not yeah. I, I, mean, I, I honestly I can't remember how long ago it was. It was a long time ago. Chris Chris Lee is on it, 1998. 1998. And now we have a sequel. 15 Uh, years ago. 15 years later. Wow. (laughs) That just to me, I don't know. I mean, I'll see it. I enjoyed Rounders, so I'm not against them making a sequel. It's just, you know, come on, wine scenes. Yeah. Aren't there like a thousand movies you can make for a million bucks each, you know? Here's some Uh, writers here. No, I know. No, I'm just saying it's like... (laughs) It's what like is it nobody... with you artsy types that have against studios <laughs> making movies people actually want to see? What's, that's what's right. the problem, I know. you artsy type? But the marriage, I get told that all two the time. sequels, like, you come on, that's types. silly. The artsy types, yes, that film that was made 15 years ago. Yep. Yeah, that sequel that everyone demanded for 15 years. <laughs> You know. Actually, there has been some demand over the years for people wanting that one. I'm still confused about Shakespeare in Love. Yeah. yeah. But I, I see the reason behind this one at least. All right. Because it won an Oscar. <laughs> Let's now get to the stories we actually plan to talk about. Chris Lee. <laughs> Sad news emerged yesterday as it was reported that one of the greatest actors ever to grace the silver screen, Peter O'Toole, passed away at the age of 81 at a hospital in London. O'Toole was always best known for his role in Lawrence of Arabia, but over the course of his career, he became one of only eight actors in history to be nominated for the Academy Award at least eight times, all of which for O'Toole were the best leading actor. On top of those nominations, O'Toole was honored in 2003 with an honorary Academy Award for a lifetime achievement. John, your thoughts on the passing of Peter O'Toole? Um, it's a different kind of sadness you, than with the recent passing of Paul Walker. Because, mm-hmm. you know, when Paul Walker passed away, very young man, right in his prime, just coming into the height of his, of his popularity. And, and so there's an extra element of tragedy here. Peter O'Toole, 81 years old, uh, still could have had a number of years in front of him, but there, there's less of a tragic note to it, but a sadness. This is... You know, as movie fans, all of us will sit around sometimes and hyperbolize and use things like one of the greatest, one of the best. Peter O'Toole is one of the greatest actors ever to be on the silver screen, ever. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not just talking about, it's, it's okay and natural for a lot of us just to think about Lawrence of Arabia. The dude was nominated for Best Lead Actor eight times, as recently as 2007 for Venus. Um, my personal favorite performance of his was My Favorite Year which is actually one of the very first movies I've ever, I ever watched. Mm-hmm. I think it was like 82 or 83. I was like a, I was a little kid at the time. Um, but he was just so astonishing. And recently, a lot of people don't realize he was the voice of Anton Ego in Ratatouille. Ratatouille. He was the voice of the food critic. Um, I loved him in Stardust as the, the king mm-hmm. who was dying. Um, he was one of the only things I liked about Troy. And I'm just picking out some of the more recent things. But listen to this. You want to put this in perspective. Chris Lee mentioned one of only eight actors in history to be nominated for, for an Acting Academy Award eight times, okay? Uh, there, there are a number of other actresses who also, but in, in the actor category, only eight. Listen to the company Peter O'Toole is in. These are the other guys who have at least eight Academy Award nominations. Al Pacino, Jack Lemmon, Marlon Brando, Paul Newman, Spencer Tracy, Sir Lawrence Olivier, and Jack Nicholson. Wow. That is the company... Peter O'Toole keeps. Um, and it's, you know, he has been out of the mainstream for, for a while, but you know, he's, he ended the major part of his career a number of years ago. 
And so it's really a shame that a lot of moviegoers, say under you know 28, really haven't experienced a lot of Peter O'Toole. Start with Lawrence of Arabia because it is his quintessential film, but yeah. then watch all of them. If you want to see what a real actor is, this was the guy. We've lost a treasure, uh, and uh, hopefully after we get over the initial sadness, we can just spend a few days just celebrating the amazing career and everything that Peter O'Toole gave us. Anyway, Amy Rose. Yeah, I think you know that. I mean, Lawrence of Arabia was his film. Like, that's what just made him just come alive. Mm -hmm. And he became that actor to me that, appearing in Stardust, appearing in all these films, that it just brought a smile to my face. Yeah. Because he just has this movie star quality that so many actors nowadays don't have. When he's on screen, he just lights it up. And his eyes are so powerful and intense. And uh, yeah, it's it's. I think you nailed it too with the, the Paul Walker thing. He, he 81 is not old by standards, but you know he has a huge resume, a huge filmography of his life and of his accomplishments. And you know we will sadly miss his presence, but he will definitely go down if he's not already by standards. I hope that a lot of people who have not seen his earlier works, this will maybe jumpstart that because yeah. a lot of people have not seen Lawrence of Arabia. I know it's crazy. <laughs> it's yeah. insane. It's crazy. So hopefully this will bring attention to some of his work and just some of his uh, accomplishments. And reading off that <clears throat> list, I mean, what a powerful group of actors to be among. So yeah. we definitely lost a treasure, um, but his work will be remembered forever. Schnapp. Yeah, just recently, just two weeks ago, I saw for the first time in my life Beckett, where right, Peter yeah. O'Toole and Richard Burton are going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And it's an incredible movie. You can check it out right now. It's, it's streaming on all the streaming channels. And uh, it's a sad thing. I mean, he's a he, he was an actor who could make Supergirl worth watching. Right. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. This guy was just incredible in, in every film he he touched. So it's a sad thing to see him uh, go. Yeah, absolutely. All right, what's next? Just before the weekend, it was announced that Disney had purchased the future distribution rights to the Indiana Jones franchise from Paramount Studios. Although Disney already owned the rights to Indiana Jones through their purchase of Lucasfilm, Paramount already held a distribution deal for Indy. With the purchase of the distribution rights, Disney is now in full control of the Indiana Jones franchise, which raises, raises questions about when we could see another Indy adventure on the big screen. Well, according to Disney chairman Alan Horn, the answer seems to be not for a while. The Disney executive reportedly said they were at least two to three years away from producing a new indie movie and that they had no story yet. Amy Rose, what do you think the immediate future of Indiana Jones is? I think our man Alan Horn just told us it's going to be a mm. couple of years. I mean, they're not dumb. This franchise has such a built-in fan base and audience, and they're definitely going to capitalize on that. They wouldn't have worked so hard to acquire the rights fully if they had no intention on doing that. Um, and I hope we see more. I mean, a lot of people knocked. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I didn't feel like it was as magical as the first three films, but I didn't hate it. I didn't think it was completely awful, but I definitely think it was a waste of a lot of good talent and stuff. But I still love this franchise. And, you know, in Indiana Jones himself, Han Solo himself, my goodness, he's already 71, right? 71. 71. Oh, so, really? Yep. Yeah. So the later <laughs> they wait, the more we can count on it simply if he is in the film just getting a, a fun little whip or a little tip of the hat. I think it just <clears> ensures <throat> that his participation is not going to be as much as maybe we would like. Um, but that doesn't matter to me as, as much as they get him. Just getting him in for the nostalgia alone is what I want. But, yeah, I really want to see this franchise continue. Um, I just think there's so many fun directions they can go with it. I mean, the character of Indiana Jones is immortalized. He's amazing, and I just love adventure films, and I think that they definitely are going to show us, but their slate's pretty packed right now. They have a, a lot of commitments out there, um, so take your time. Get a great script, great director, all of that, but I do think we'll see it just, obviously, in a few years, as Alan Horn said. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to see yeah. more Indiana. I mean, Disney won't go out and rebuy back the distribution rights from Paramount if they had no intention exactly. of making another Nana Jones. That being said, and this is all speculation on my part, take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. I believe they have no intention of involving Harrison Ford oh. uh, moving forward. And I, I'm going to tell you right now, and this will make a lot of you hate me who don't already hate me, um, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with them not including Harrison Ford. And, and here's why. Harrison Ford has served us so well. I, it's kind of the same way I feel about a Hugh Jackman stepping away from Wolverine, right? I love Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. Dude, you have served us as fans for 14 years, whatever it is. You're, you deserve to step away. Harrison Ford has been Indiana Jones for us for generations. And it's okay 
for him to put down the whip. Um, and, you know, the one problem that I really had with Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, mm -hmm. and this is another reason why I think they may step away from Harrison Ford and relaunch it, to me, Indiana Jones lives in the World War II era. To me, Indiana Jones is fighting the Nazis. To me, that's Indiana Jones. And for me, in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, it always felt out of place him going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ruskies, you know? The, the whole Cold War thing, the nuking of the fridge, the whatever. You know, I said this before, because I'm with you. I didn't hate Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. And, and follow me here. I always contended that, you know what? If you took the movie, The Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and you just switched out Harrison Ford with another actor and didn't call him Indiana Jones, I think more people would have been more forgiving of the film and maybe had a little bit more fun with it. Because as just a, a standard paint-by-numbers little adventure movie, it's not that bad. But it wasn't an Indiana Jones exactly. film at all. And so I think, <coughs> I think they're ready to move away from it. I don't want to see Indy moved into the 1980s now. I don't want to see Indy um, there. And I think by saying they're going to be waiting another, like you said, Harrison's 71 years old now. Saying they're going to wait at least another two or three years to get started, I, I think the flags are waving that they're probably getting ready to move on from Harrison Ford. I could be completely wrong, and I'll be okay with it if I'm wrong, but that's kind of how I see things working out. Schnepp? Um, I know you guys liked it. I absolutely hated the Crystal Skull. Movie. I didn't, didn't like I liked it. it. Just I just didn't just, love uh, it. No, but I just, yeah. I mean, I'm in the camp of like extreme Hate hatred yeah. where I felt like every, and, and I'll say this, if you put another character in it, like Slampy Scripples and the Crystal Skull, it would have still sucked. Because it was just right. a horribly written film and no one was into it. I, when I was watching the movie, I could tell Spielberg was bored. Like just he did, it was just he did master setups and then a couple of close ups on giant sets that they spent all this money on building. It was like, yeah, yeah, yeah we'll just CG in it later. You know, let's go move on, move on. Harrison Ford was stoned, just like tired, like, oh God. Everything about, once we got into the jungle with John Hurt, all the, the whole story fell apart. I just, extreme disappointment for me. And what about giant, the monkey chase scene? Oh, oh, come on, Chef. Don't tell me you didn't oh. love the monkey chase scene. The monkeys scene. actually had <laughs> hair like Shia LaBeouf. I remember, <laughs> I remember that. They were like, how did the monkeys have 50s doo-wop hair? That's pretty skillful. Come and on. I like Shia. I think he's a good actor. I think he's a great actor. He was so wrong, wrong for that role. Wrong for that movie. A bunch of people in the chat board are going to point out here. A lot of people are jumping up and saying, hey, if, if you're not going to have Harrison, bring in Nathan Fillion to be in the end of I, I think that's great. But real quick, you mentioned Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. Right. I, I disagree with that because the character of the Wolverine is so much larger than Hugh Jackman. He's become this embodiment, and he's fantastic at it. But Harrison Ford is Indiana Jones. He is, Here's like, he is the epitome of that character. I so was going to say, I, don't... I think Harrison Ford will be in this new sequel, well, eh. but they're going to pass it on. Right. Like, yeah. I think he'll be in it. It'll be called Indiana Jones and the yeah. something something, but then the next two will be Raiders of the Lost Atlantis, or they're going to bring in the Jones he'll boys. Play more, he'll Shia. play more <laughs> of the Sean Connery yeah. role. Yeah. From the third front. See, and I, I would like I'm to cool see them go back to the Nazi era. That's where I'm Me more too. But check this out. What if they, because Harrison Ford's aged about eight years since they shot Crystal Skull, why not rock right into the 60s? You have conspiracy theories, yeah. you have JFK, you have, you have a ton. And just say Harrison Ford wasn't Indiana Jones? No, no, he's still Indiana Jones. He's just older like he is now. More like a but Sean Connery figure. I like that. Yeah. So they're going to break their own continuity and go back to the 60s. Well, no, the, in the... The Crystal Skull was in the 50s. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, they yeah, already broke true. the continuity. I want the Nazi era. Yeah. I want the Nazis. Remember, the first, the, Nazis, the first three John. went backwards in time. <laughs> now someone's going to quote me. John yeah. Campia said he wants Nazis. <laughs> yeah. I know. Completely Just out of context. I can't believe there. Campia's into Nazis. <laughs> what? I didn't say that. Yeah. All right, listen, folks. It's uh, time for that part of the show called Buy or Sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Chris Lee's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then Schnepp, Amy Rose, and I are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Chris Lee, what do we got? The cast for the upcoming drama Triple Nine seems to be coming together. Reports have come out that Casey Affleck from Out of the Furnace, Chewy Tell Ijia Four from 12 Years a Slave, and Michael B. Jordan of Fruitvale Station are now in talks to join Kate Blanchett and Christoph Waltz for the crime drama, which centers on an L.A. heist in which a group of thieves plan to kill a cop, a code 999 in police terminology, to divert authorities from another crime scene across town. Schnepp Byer sell, sell the sounds of Triple Nine. Uh, I'll just buy it simply based on that powerhouse cast. I mean, that's just, you know, every single actor is incredible. So I'm, I'm kind of guessing that this is going to be a little bit better written than a normal police procedural, that this is going to be uh, an incredible thriller. So I'm all on board. Okay, put, put this in perspective. 
We got this image back here. <laughs> Casey Affleck is the weakest actor in this picture. And Casey Affleck is awesome. Yeah, yes. He's incredible. <laughs> I mean, look at this lineup. <laughs> this this is stupid. It's so filled with talent. Yeah. Like absolutely <laughs> stupid how filled with talent is this. I'm completely on board. I buy this. In your oh, eyes? I yeah, I, I buy it so enthusiastically. And I mean the three on the left, Casey Affleck. I think it was the three of their breakout years with 12 years, Fruitvale Station and Out of the Furnace. Those three performances were incredible. Kate Blanchett and Christoph Waltz are in their own categories. They're like royalty. They right, really are. Right. But those five together, magic. I don't even care what the movie's about. I literally got chills when I read that roster. So I'm enthusiastic by it. I repeat, this is stupid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kate, Kate Blanchett made the Crystal Skull. She was that one standout oh, for me. That's what Blue I'll Jasmine. Say. All right, what's next? The new Terminator film is set to hit AMC theaters on July 2nd, 2015, and it appears we now have our new Sarah Connor. According to reports, Game of Thrones star Amelia Clark has won the role for the relaunching franchise. Clark joins the already attached Arnold Schwarzenegger with Zero Dark Thirty star Jason Clark in talks to play an older version of Sarah Connor's son, John Connor. John, buy or sell the casting of Amelia Clark for Sarah Connor. I'm going to sell it, um, and for, for a couple reasons. One. Uh, I know we all love her in Game of Thrones. I, I know we do, but it's it's history has proven an awful lot that when you just go with who's hot on TV right now, despite not really having much else behind them, it doesn't always work out. Uh, we see uh, Jon Snow right now. He's got that Pompeii movie coming out, and that doesn't look so great either. Um, and you know what? I'll be honest. I, at this point, while she plays the character pretty well, I'm not so sure how strong of an actress she is yet. Um, look, I'm not saying she's going to be bad. I'm not. She's got some. She's had some decent training behind her. She's got some nice experience behind her too. This could work out really well. I'm just saying for me, I haven't seen enough from her to be excited about her being the new Sarah Connor. So just on that, I'm not poo-pooing it, but I'm just not in a position that I can buy it. So by default, I'm going to sell it. Amy Rose. I'm enthusiastically buying this. I think that she is a fantastic fit for this. Game of Thrones is not just a TV show. It's a huge, epic production. And she's no, phenomenal. No, it's a TV show. She's phenomenal sure. on it. Yeah, George Clooney never had a career. He started on TV. Of course he did. Will Smith never had a career. He started on TV. I could go down the list. There's so many yep, people. You can name 20 and 25 years. I can add more than that. But no, anyway, can. the point is, I think she seems like a really great fit. Terminator franchise, Linda Hamilton, is such a babe. She's so fierce. And I really think that we've seen enough from her character of Khaleesi to be a good warrior like we want her to be filling the big shoes of Linda Hamilton in this role so I think she's phenomenal she's beautiful and talented and I'm really excited that people are taking a chance on her because I think she's going to impress yep. I buy it as well I mean not only does she look a little bit like Linda mm -hmm. Hamilton like when L Linda was like you know like 25 years ago but uh, I think she can carry this role oh, I mean yeah. I, <clears throat> I think you know Lena Headey played uh the, this character in, on a TV series. I don't know if they're going to spin it out. I know they're going to combine this movie series with the television show. It's still show unclear because they got Arnold coming right. back and, and there's whispers <clears throat> about having it loosely associated with the new TV show. It's really unclear. Well, I think they're, they're going to the, they they play with the time. <laughs> you're right. You're right. <laughs> they're going to play with the timelines. They're going to like one specific event crisscrosses and then the TV show sure. goes this way and the movie series goes that way and then they'll re crisscross later like that's sounds confusing separate <laughs> issue i think it's a horrible idea well i mean it, you know, it, it, it's brave to try the terminator series on a whole they've you, they've played a lot with time yeah. travel mm -hmm. and you know terminator salvation a lot of people hated that but i'm just saying it's still john connor's what happened to him we don't know that's a you know some other s fragment of some timeline that's not real and who knows what's going to happen i think it's weird that both actors both have the same last name and they're playing right? each oh, yeah. other's mother and son. So How the confusing. Connors are played by the Clarks. Is that what? I, yeah, that's just weird to me. But yeah. That's the only reason it. they got the role. Obviously. Yeah, they were like, your last name is the same. You're hired. Yeah. So. All right. What's next? The first teaser trailer for the upcoming Christopher Nolan film Interstellar has hit the web. Interstellar chronicles the adventures of a group of explorers who make use of a newly discovered wormhole to surpass the limitations on human space travel and conquer the vast distances involved in an interstellar voyage. The film opens up in AMC theaters on November 7th. Amy Rose, buy or sell the first teaser trailer for Interstellar. I'm going to buy it. I saw it this weekend. I, I, I know it leaked on the internet, but I, I was seeing Smaug again, and I saw it in the theater, IMAX, Full D, and 
I just, I just love what Nolan and team do because they really don't reveal a lot about the film. And I love that with a teaser. I don't want to see the whole film in a three minute clip, you know? And I think that they do that really well. And I love Matthew McConaughey's voice as the narration because he's just had such a breakout year again. And I'm just so excited. Nolan is a filmmaker I really trust. He's a true visionary. And this cast alone is incredible. I love that it deals with time travel and all this. And I think the trailer showed us just enough to get us excited, but not enough to still keep us, you know, the mystery laugh, so I'm I'm really excited. Schnapp. Uh, co -co 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 cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 the cocaine is back. That's right. Is back. Um, <laughs> That's all I see yeah. now. Thanks to you, when I look at this picture, it's a big line of cocaine. <laughs> co -co -co -co. Um, so, yeah, I'm gonna buy the trailer though, and I'm I was saying just a, like a week ago, show me nothing. I don't want all these trailers. Show everything. Mm -hmm. And I really like this trailer because it did build up this kind of strange mystery. But I'm like, what's up with all the corn? <laughs> I'm like, is this cornhole? Is like the wormhole inside of corn? Like oh, people yeah. are eating corn and then, oh, I got a corn nugget. And I mean, it's just weird how much corn is in this trailer. <laughs> That's, That's what like, offended yeah. you. <laughs> the the trailer threw me off. I, I'm buying the trailer. But, but like, too make, much corn. Too much corn. <laughs> if the next trailer has more corn, I'm going to start to get worried. All right. I'm going to sell this trailer. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, look, here's, here's the thing. A lot of people think, when they talk about trailers, um, a lot of people will talk in one of two extremes. Mm -hmm. Either it gives you everything and it shows everything and gives everything away, or it shows you absolutely nothing. There is a middle ground. Um, a good, would you go into a store and see, see a box on the shelf and it just says, um, fun. <laughs> And it, I'm it, it, it doesn't explain to you. It doesn't explain to you what is in the box. You don't it like fun, you, John? You, you, well, you picked the wrong word because I would what, buy yeah. that. What kind of fun is it? How will this give me fun? I mean, there's there's something to be said about. Hey, guess what? Give me a description about what it is. Just just tell me what it is, so I can then take it out and experience it and really get into how great it is and how fun it is. You want at least tell me what it's about. And I think a lot of people, you know, when I try to bring up, when I'm frustrated with trailers that give me nothing, people go. Well, why do you want it to give everything away? I don't want it to give everything away. Just, just give me an idea about the movie. Look, here's the facts. And the fact is this. And I said this on Mailbag this weekend. This Interstellar trailer, and Interstellar is going to be an amazing movie. Let's make no mistake about that. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait to see it. It's going to be incredible. And as we get closer to it, I'm sure the future trailers are going to be awesome. But just take this trailer, take out the name Christopher Nolan. Nobody's talking about this. Everybody is only gets excited and says they love this trailer because it says, brought to you by Christopher Nolan. I don't think that's true. And, and no, that's it at all, because the entire opening is nothing about, remember that old Star Trek TV show, Enterprise? The opening credits? That's what this trailer was. It, they stole it from the opening credits of Enterprise. It was, just, it was just historical footage of, here's a guy riding in a boat. Here's a guy flying a plane. No, but here's then they a guy had Matthew McConaughey yeah. like a strange driving in a car. Corn. corn. Yeah. A lot corn. of corn. Corn holy. So, yeah. so I, as a teaser trailer, um, I don't want it to, to be the full trailer. We shouldn't, ex we shouldn't judge it as a full trailer because we're still seven months off from that. And the movie's going to be amazing. But simply put, from this trailer, if I didn't already read the description of the movie, this trailer is just a blank box sitting on a Best Buy shelf. That's all it is. <laughs> with the name Christopher Nolan on it. And that's ha! it. Um, so I think as a teaser trailer, honestly, I, I don't think it's very good <coughs> as a teaser trailer. But I'm confident that future trailers will be amazing, and I'm confident that the movie itself will be amazing. Uh, I'm really stoked for it, but I gotta be honest, I cannot buy the Would trailer. you have liked this trailer better if it had that Hans Zimmer, and then, and then showed some, like a slow push in on a cornfield, and, and then like a space astronaut shaking, oh, yeah. you know? A, honestly, when I saw that that trailer was up, I was half expecting to hear that horn. Yeah. Every time they're going to show somebody's name and hear that, but they didn't do it. So actually, that was the other pleasing moment for me of this trailer. Unpredictable. They did, that unpredictable. it didn't do that. Yeah. Historical footage and driving through corn. <laughs> All right. Uh, listen, uh, we are going to go into mailbag now. But listen, before we sign off the show here, we're we going to take more. just... What? We got we another have one? one more. I know that you're rushing to mailbag, but we have one more. Oh my gosh, I'm not excited about one. it, but you may be excited. Thanks, Chrisley. I totally I lost it. I Dang, totally you lost know, it. It's live. Don't worry about it. Okay, Chris. I'm gonna tell you what What's I'm not next? excited about. 20th Century Fox has announced that the upcoming sequels to Avatar, Avatar 2, 3, and 4 will all shoot back to back in New Zealand beginning in 2014. The Avatar films will release in 2016, 2017, and 2018 with Sam Worthington, Zoe 
Saldana and Stephen Lang all returning in their respective roles. Schnepp, buy or sell the three Avatar sequels shooting back to back in New Zealand. More blue people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bark. Wah, yeah. Birds and stuff. <laughs> now we're underwater. Wah, you know. <laughs> no, I buy it. I, I loved Avatar. I can't wait. James Cameron's completely sweaty about his little world that he created, yeah. the Navi, and you know, I I can't wait to see them go underwater. Go, you know, that weird tree is probably going to be Sigourney Reaver. You know, she got absorbed by the Tree Matrix. And Ooh, I like they're that. They're going to have a lot of cool stuff. It's I can't wait, and I'm really happy that they're shooting them all back to back. I love that. Just like The Hobbit, you get one every year. I think yeah. that's a perfect way to go, especially if you're doing a trilogy like what he's doing. So I'm all for it. I can't wait. Hey, Rose? Yeah, from a monetary point, by because it makes so much sense, not only to, you know, financially keep everything tight, but also the actors keep them relatively, you know, in the same physical shape and mm -hmm. age and all that, and it, it makes a lot of sense. I really liked Avatar, even though it was Ferngully Lost Rainforest and Dances with Wolves and so many other influences, mm -hmm. um, but visually it was so stunning, and James Cameron constantly pushes the bar, but raises the bar with his cinema, cinematography and everything, so yeah, I'm excited to re-enter this world as well. I'm going to sell this. This is stupid. No, I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. I, I, I buy this. And, and they're doing it exactly the right way. Yeah. Yeah. Shoot. If you know you're going to do sequels, well, you got everybody together. Yeah. Just from a logistics point of view, a financial point of view, make them all. It's cheaper that way. It's more yeah. efficient that way. And we as fans don't have to wait three years in between. The only thing I don't like about this, the only thing I don't like about this, is that I am one of these guys who have been waiting for about seven years for Cameron to get around to Battle Angel. That is yeah. the end, so now, I mean, that's now way off. And so that's the only thing I don't like about this. Other than that, this is the right way to do this. Well, he'll be finished quicker since they're yeah, maybe, right. yes. Uh, Chris Lee, now is it time to move on? I'm <laughs> yeah, not sure anymore. Now I've lost all on. sense of reality. Okay, <laughs> so, um, hey, listen, we're getting to mailbag right now, but listen, we're going to take a couple questions as well from the chat board. So if you want to start throwing in a few questions to the chat board, Chris Lee has the hammer of power, and she will decide what questions get asked from the chat board. But before we get to that, we're going to get through these mailbag questions first. So, Chris Lee, what do we got? We have Thomas Edward writes, I'm a big fan of your show, and after watching Mailbag, you talked about how Marvel won't sell off their movie rights anymore, but could they just temporarily sell them for either a certain number of movies or a limited number of years, even if they just released a film and then the rights would revert back to Marvel? I think this could work, as you said. Marvel probably has no plans for Blade and Daredevil, and I'm sure Sony would love to have more heroes to add to its movies. Do you think this could work, and would it be a good idea? Um, thanks a lot for the question, Thomas. The uh, no, this wouldn't work at all, and, and, and here's why. Let me give you, as I often fall back on, is, is a sporting uh, analogy here, okay? Let's say you're the Toronto Raptors, my poor, terrible Toronto Raptors, and you've got some guy named uh, Eddie Brown who's like, you know, five foot one and is just terrible. He's awful. And somebody says, well, hey, wait a minute. Let's trade Eddie Brown to the Miami Heat for LeBron James. And everybody in Toronto's like, yeah, that's a great idea. Why don't you make that trade? Well, why? Because Miami would never make that trade. In talking about, okay, well, what if Marvel just gives up the rights to, say, Blade for, like, three years and then get the rights back and, and just have it in the contract that the rights then automatically revert back? Yay, that's a great idea for Marvel because they weren't going to do anything with Blade in the next three years anyway. Great idea. Here's the problem. There's no studio that will sign that deal. Studios are in the business of trying to build franchises for the long haul. Every studio wants the next X-Men thing where they know they're going to get 12 movies out of it. No studio, like Universal, will not go, yeah, Marvel, we'll buy the rights to Blade that we only get for three years, and we'll invest into the character, and we'll develop him, and we'll make him popular, and then we'll just, after we put in all that work to develop this as a franchise, we will just hand it back to Marvel. Mm -hmm. um, that just won't happen. I mean, it's a great idea from Marvel's point of view. You're absolutely right, it is. But let's face it, you, if you were the other studio, would not make that deal. I would not make that deal. I don't think any studio in the right mind would make that deal. So I, I just can't see that happening. Amy Rose? The only one it really benefits are the fans. <laughs> That's it. Because And Marvel. <laughs> it would benefit well, Marvel. Everything benefits <laughs> <Yes>. Marvel. <laughs> Kevin Feige knows what he's doing. But yeah, I mean, 
rights are such a tricky thing anyway, so the fact that it finally resorted back to them, they're not going to give it up anytime soon. And as you stated, especially with comic book films, they're trying to build a franchise. If they put all the love and intention, I mean, look what uh, Sony has done with Spider-Man. Yeah. They're now expanding their universe. You think they'd be like, actually, you guys can take Venom, and uh, we'll just do all the dirty work over here. And like, it just doesn't work that way. Rights are so tricky anyway. And that's why Marvel, originally, when they sold it off, um, the characters to different studios, had it in, you know, as a stipulation that if you don't make the film within this amount of years, yes. that it resorts back to us. That's why they did that. They were very, very smart in crafting that out. So when they finally got it back, because it wasn't created, they're not going to give it back so easily. So I don't see it happening. In a dream world, it sounds great because I would love another Blade, but yeah, it's not going to happen. Schnapp. Yeah, <clears throat> we've, t we've talked about this a lot of as far as the, you know, divvying up these rights. I mean, Marvel has been like in the business of getting their rights back. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking about Daredevil. There's like a Daredevil miniseries on Netflix coming out. That, to me, is a dream come true. I've, I've wanted that to happen. And, and all these other like uh, smaller characters are, are being put into television shows. You'd never see that if it, if it was like, it wasn't a consortium of mm -hmm. characters. Like Marvel. Arrow. Yeah, Marvel can just be like, all right, this is for TV, this is for movies, we'll try the Combino later, video game, you know? So <clears throat> you're not gonna get that if they give Blade to Universal. So, you know, it just won't happen. And I don't see that happening in the future. I think Marvel's being really smart about what they're doing. And uh, <clears throat> we benefit as fans from seeing, you know, Sony, you know, making all these extra Spider-Man yeah. films or, mm -hmm. or Fox really trying to push all the X-Men because that's all they got. So they're really going to make X-Force. Yeah. They might even make X-Static, please. Woo. I love X-Static. So, you know, we're, we'll benefit. Marvel has, I don't know, several thousand characters that they can, they're, they're readily w waiting to be made into television shows and more specifically movies. So I don't see any problems. You don't have to worry about it. We'll get, we'll get to all those characters, I'm sure. So. All right, uh, is, is there another mailbag question? I can't there remember. Is. All right, I can't remember there who did is. the first one or the second one. All right. <laughs> Brandon Wedig writes, hello AMC, love the show. My question is about filmmaking in Canada. As a current film student at Capilano University in Vancouver, I love it when big Hollywood movies are shot here, such as X2, Mission Impossible 4, Tron Legacy, and Fantastic Four. Now, my question is, why aren't movies that are filmed in Canada take place in Canada? It seems to be that we have to disguise Canada to look <laughs> like the United States when sometimes it just isn't necessary. Now, I know there are some exceptions like the films I listed before but why don't fi films take place in Canada when they are shot here what are your thoughts thanks well it's kind of like characters right I mean you write a story first and you write who the character is you don't then change the character because you want to because you put a certain actor in it you f get an actor to fit the character you know when guys are writing movies if they write that hey uh, this this action sequence takes place in New York City now you just need to find a set and if the best set is downtown Hamilton, Ontario. My hometown is Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, right? A lot of the Incredible Hulk movie with Edward Norton was shot in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Actually, the big fight in the street at the end with the abomination was outside of my loft window, uh -huh. uh, like on, awesome. on, on James Street and on King Street in, in Hamilton. That's where it all happened. But that's just the set. You know, it's already in the story where it is, and then they go out and say, where can we find a really good set to do this? You don't change the story to suit the set any more than you change the story of a movie to suit the actor. You find things that fit the story, and if a location in Canada is financially viable and it fits what they need the scene to be, then you go do it. But you don't then change the movie to say it's happening in Canada. That's, that's putting the cart before the horse. Anyway, what do you guys think? I don't think Detroit's upset that uh, Gotham has taken over and they're right. not giving them credit. I mean, it happens all the time to fit within a story. So while, you know, a, the good Canadian boy at the table, I'm sure would like to see it represented more. Um, it's oh, just, Canada. <laughs> well, look what I did. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, it just fits within the story. I don't think they're trying to hide the fact that they're filming there, um, but usually they're using the beauty to fit within the guideline of a story. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, Canada is, is America's plaything, as you know. It's, I mean, it's, like, you know like, it's sort of like we've been going to Canada for years, making television shows there. Uh, there's, like, better tax benefits for all the U.S. production. So, I mean, Canada can be all these different things, but it's not just Canada. Like you said, it's Detroit. It's like, There's all these different, all these different uh, states that can fill, fit in for what's way more expensive. Let's shut an entire street down in New York. A, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> B, it's not going to happen. So you're going somewhere else to make that happen. Go get your B team to shoot the, you know, you know the, the coverage of, of New York and get, make sure you get that skyline, then shoot somewhere else. That's just how it is. 
All right, folks, uh, we're gonna, we've gone so far over time here. I'm sure the, the studio people here are really ready to throw me out, but we are going to take a couple questions from the chat board since you know over a thousand of you are already in there and you've been asking questions or whatever. We're gonna take some time, uh, field a couple of them. Chris Lee's got her hammer of justice over there. So uh, Chris Lee, what do you judge? I have, and I've been yelling at all our chat boarders that if you keep co copying and pasting the same question 25 times, I'm not going to pick it. You heard it from one <laughs> I'm not going to pick it. Um, okay, so Ryan M. wants to know, we're getting ready for Oscar time, so what do you guys think that any, do you guys think anything but Gravity or 12 Years a Slave will win Best Picture at the Oscars this year? Yeah, I'm not even sure how much of a chance Gravity has. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's 12 Years a Slave. I think her is getting a lot oh, yeah. of attention. Um, uh, American Hustle is uh, getting a lot of love too. American Hustle, Saving Mr. Banks is mm -hmm. actually getting some attention. I, I'm not sure what, I, I wouldn't even put, I mean anything can happen, anything can happen, but I wouldn't put Gravity in my top three, if I had to put money on it and rank them as to what I think has the best odds of winning, I don't know that I'd, I'd give Gravity a top three. I think it's probably going to be 12 Years a Slave. It's funny, this morning the Online Film Critics Society actually put out their annual awards and like 12 Years a Slave swept best picture, best actor, best supporting actor, best supporting actress. It, it swept a lot. I think best adapted screenplay as well. Um, it totally swept. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's probably, gonna, at this point, I think it's 12 Years a Slave. What do you guys think? I wouldn't actually want Gravity to win for Best Picture. I want it to win for effects and lighting and sound and all of that. And maybe amazing. directing. And directing. Alfonso Cuaron yeah, is Alfonso was a, did an amazing as great job as with it that. Gets. Yeah. But there really is such a formula to who's going to win Best Picture. I mean, the Academy loves underdog films. They love historical films. And that's what 12 Years a Slave is. And it's our history, our painful history right here in, on our soil. So... Not Except to mention for us Canadians Steve who were more enlightened. Well, you're not part of this I just want to point out that, that one yeah, of the heroes yeah. in 12 Years a Slave was a Canadian. I just, right. I just wanted you to just point that out. You just had to. But, you know, it really does spell Academy. And Steve yeah. McQueen as a filmmaker is just so amazing, amazing at evoking emotion and just paralyzing you. And the performances and everything, I think, as a whole film is just so strong. But there are a lot of other great films out there. But that one seems to be the front runner right now. And I wouldn't be disappointed. And momentum can change. I mean, yeah. honestly, people... People get sick of my sports analogies, but honestly, the Oscars is a lot like a sporting event. There is momentum shifts. Yeah. Things can go back and forth, so we'll see where well, we are as we get into January. Well, look at Fruitvale Station and yeah. The Butler. They came out several months before, so now people aren't even remembering what amazing films those are. Same with Prisoners. You know, all these other films were released more recently or are still being released, so they're the hot ch yeah, children right now. I think Prisoners right will get a lot of attention from Yeah, Oscar I hope time. so. Yeah, I mean, but Prisoners to me, is it's not an Academy film. It's more of like a good thriller. I thought the acting was superb. It was, but it, I mean, honestly, it did, to me, it's like not in the same rank. Yeah. I mean, that's just me. But uh, yeah, 12 Years a Slave is going to sweep it. I mean, there's really, I mean, I, I loved Gravity. And yes, I agree, it's going to get the special effects. It, it, it will win that. Um, and it was amazingly well directed. Mm. But, yeah, superbly but directed. 12 Years a Slave is better directed, I, in, my, in my feeling about it. Just because... It emotionally Ugh. crushed me and 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 was so moving and such an incredibly well made film. Like some people question the longer shots or the longer takes, and it's like it's how you create an emotional oh, yeah. scene and it's how you create a feeling. It's art. It, it, well, it art. really transcended cinema for me. So I mean that alone I feel like it should just win everything. I mean all right, let's, uh, we are way over time, but we're going to take one more. We're going to take one more. <laughs> because I know there's two video game guys at the table, I thought this question was really interesting. Two? Rue Pereira says, question, do you guys think if video games movies followed exactly the plot from the video game, they could be any better? No. No, and I, I've been saying that for forever. No. I mean, everybody likes to argue with me, but I'm sorry, you're wrong. The narrative in 90% of video games feel perfect for the game because the main point of a video game is gameplay. That's what you have to make great. If you want to get people hooked on your game, make great gameplay. And really, ultimately, when you look at the narrative in a, in a, in a video game, when you really break it down into a synopsis, it, it's not enough to flesh out an entire movie. A lot of people say, yes, it is, yes, it is. No, it's not. There are exceptions. There are exceptions, but generally speaking, that's the case. So no, when you do a video game adaptation, you have to adapt it. You have to take the spirit of the game and then apply it into the best movie you possibly can. Um, and I think if you just try to go literal for it, no, nah, you'll get the people who are really faithful to the game, but that's not enough to make a hit film. So anyway, Schnepp, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I mean, if you, if you just you watch the cut scenes from any of those Call of Duties, they're great, but they're also two minutes. So, I mean, if you like used any one of those Call of Duty cutscenes and put them all together, it's maybe 20 minutes. 
and it's like a fragment of a story because it's all about you. And you, you were captured, now he's trying to get the information onto your next mission. I mean, most of the times I'll skip cutscenes if I'm playing a video game because I just want to play the game. You know, I'll watch cutscenes later, like on, on YouTube or something. I don't want to watch it while I'm playing the game. I usually am like, all right, I know. Let's, you know, you kind of know where you're going. So I agree. It's like uh, when it's being adapted into a film, you have to bring in all those like little characters and then actually make them characters and not just like icons. Hey, Rose? Yeah, I f think it's middle ground with every piece of content being adapted to the big screen from comics to books to, you know, I think that to video games. I mean, I. We are obviously the two Chris Lee was talking about because I am a big supporter. I think there's a lot of amazing narratives and content and games to bring to the big screen. But, you know, the filmmakers need to make the judgment call and a lot of things translate. They have to make decisions that are going to work better on the screen that they did maybe in the game. So yeah. it's about the happy medium, but it's also about pleasing the fans of this franchise that help elevate these games to the level of success that they are. So they can't disregard everything or oh, it's no, going to piss off all. a lot of people, yeah. Yeah. but they have to make important filmmaker decisions that would wouldn't necessarily be in the game. So it's all about the happy medium. Well, it's, a, it's a totally, it's a transformative medium. There's a lot of people always use comic books as an example, like why don't you just take the comic book and make that the movie? Like use those panels, as it's already done for you. you can, it's all storyboarded and it's like, it doesn't translate. There's thought bubbles. That in that one panel, there's like 11 paragraphs of the dude's inner thoughts. That's, it doesn't work that way, so. Yeah. All right, folks, listen, we've gone way over time, <laughs> so we are going to call it a day. Thanks so much for joining us. Listen, I want to remind you once again, January 2nd, we are going to have our 24-hour, heaven help my voice, we're going to have a 24-hour AMC Movie Talk Marathon starting at 10 a.m. on January 2nd. Make sure you join us for that, but you don't have to wait until then to donate to the great <coughs> cause we are supporting right now. Just go to the URL you see below there, or look in the description of this video. It's right at the top. There's a link. Click there, and then click Donate Now. People, Some people have donated 10 bucks. Somebody even donated 1000 bucks. I mean, anywhere in between. Just go and help out for a really good cause. I want to remind you, there's a lot of great films playing in AMC theaters right now, not the least of which is The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smaug. You can go over to our AMC uh, Movie News YouTube channel right now, which you're on. Look for AMC Spoilers, and we have Amy Rose, myself, and Dennis have our AMC Spoilers, The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smaug, spoiler-filled review up. Oh. You can go watch it right now, only if you've seen the movie already. I want to thank the people sitting at the table <laughs> with me. First of all, our movie news editor here at AMC, Miss Amy Rose Eisenbach. Amy Rose, where can people find you online? On Twitter, at Amy Rosie. Thank you. And beside her, writer, director, film commentator extraordinaire, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you? You find me at Twitter and uh, Instagram at John Schnepp, and check out my, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, He's got to drink some water, drink some water, fat man. <clears throat> uh, Hail to the King is uh, just premiered on Machinima, so check it out. It's this little mini series I worked on. It's an animated, like, heavy metal style thing. So check it out. Uh, you might enjoy it. Woo. And, of course, uh, apparently the, the one who keeps me on track in this show, running the shop board, our lovely host today, Miss Chris Lee Candy. Chris Lee, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Twitter at Chris Lee and the movie blog on the movie chick on Tumblr. And uh, you can find me just on my various social media channels, just at John Campia. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. We will be back again tomorrow. Until next time, my name is John Campia for AMC Movie News. And until then, bye-bye. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe to AMC Movie News on YouTube. It's free and a great way to stay updated with all the latest movie news and check out our daily show, AMC Movie Talk. Also, don't forget to check us out on Facebook and Twitter to stay in the loop for our special prizes, giveaways, and contests.